Welcome to the Radical CEO, transformation stories from the C-suite with your host, Libby Gill. Libby started her career in Hollywood where she led communications at media giants, Sony, Universal, and Turner Broadcasting. Now, as a human engineering expert, she leads leadership, coaching, and consulting firm, Libby Gill & Company, where she guides Fortune 500 clients to lead through change, challenge, and chaos. An international speaker and award-winning author, Libby's mission with this videocast is to bring you intimate conversations with business and thought leaders who've transformed careers and companies with their radical ideas and bold actions. Hey there, welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us here at the Radical CEO. I'm so excited because my guest today, Jason Cutter, has this very cool background. And he's done some of the things that I find the most daunting. The first being just a few years, four years tagging sharks. I don't think so. Yeah. My other big fear is jumping out of an airplane, which even if it were, if I had to, I'm not sure I could. And then the big one that so many people, myself included, struggle with, sales. How to make sales, as we all say, not salesy, not weird, not pushy, not aggressive, not creepy, not slick, but a real human interaction where we all want to share what our value is. But he actually has a really good way of doing that and teaching that and helping others set up that internal sales force so that they can do it with that same kind of style. So uh, also interesting uh, to note that he graduated from University of California, Santa Cruz, that has my all-time favorite mascot, yes, I know this, the Madonna Slug. So that's just so cool. And welcome, Jason Cutter. Thanks for being here. Well, thank you, Libby, for having me and for that introduction. Uh, and yes, uh, the fighting banana slugs are a thing. Uh, the fighting part, uh, you know, usually we add that to it, but uh, the mighty banana slug is, uh, is definitely the motto of UC Santa Cruz, They're a very special school. And yes, I spent four years tagging sharks and doing shark research while I lived in Santa Cruz. And you were a student of marine biology, hence the shark tagging, right? Yes, which has uh, you know easily segued into my role as a sales success ah. consultant now, uh, as well as the other things I've done in my life. But yes, I have a bachelor's degree in marine biology and I focused on sharks. Many metaphors with sharks and business and sales, as you well know, you've probably heard them all before. Um, but so you started after school and after your shark tagging, you switched into the financial world. And how did you make that connection there? Well, uh, it was via a attempt to be in the tech sector when I moved to Seattle in 2000. I got a job at Microsoft doing tech support. I shortly realized that wasn't for me and I didn't like doing that because all of my coworkers spent the weekends and evenings programming or changing their computers or doing things you know, in the tech world and uh, I didn't and I thought it was boring. And so after two years of that, we all lost our jobs when they started outsourcing to China and India. Uh, in fact, we were training our counterparts over there to take all of our jobs, which I was totally okay with. Um, and then I was without a job and a family friend said, hey, here's a guy. He's in the mortgage space. He's looking to grow. Might be something for you to try. Uh, and that's really where it started uh, 17 years ago. Well, and did they want you to start because of your IT background? Because you were an <laughs> nope. expert in it? No? <laughs> nope. Did nope. you hear about that? Nope. Okay. Nothing. Nor, nor the marine biology. Uh, and either. not the sharks, right? <laughs> yep. So what expertise, were they just looking for someone to learn the business and grow with them? Someone to learn to grow that had the desire, the hunger, and the ability to uh, take some instructions and uh, answer the phone and, and do the parts that needed to be done. And you needed a job and you were smart <laughs> and you raised your hand. That's been my whole motto of my career. Raise your hand, figure it out later. Yep. I mean, assuming if you don't already know it, raise your hand, figure it out as you go. So that worked okay for you, right? Yep. And now why are you not doing that still today? You made your own segue along the way. I did. So I spent a few years doing that and I really loved the helping people part. And I will say the first six months were really painful because I didn't have any training. I had a little bit of, of mentorship as far as like, here's what you do and say, but none of the deep sales related parts. Um, but after a few years of that, I just really 
wasn't passionate about helping people get into more debt uh, and buy homes and you know the finance side. It really, it really wasn't good. For, I like dealing with people, but not in that realm. Um, and so then I switched to helping people who were in debt, who had mortgages, who were facing foreclosure and needed help in avoiding that and not losing their home uh, to you know the sheriff coming and knocking on their door after the auction. And so like that fit with me wanting to be in sales and help people but on the other side of, uh, let's say, the, del the debt cycle. That must have been heart-wrenching, seeing people go through that process. Uh, yes, and it was interesting because when I started in that with a friend of mine and we became business partners, it was during the peak of the real estate market in the Seattle area in Washington State, and yet there were still, at that time, 30 to 40 people uh, going into foreclosure every single day just in one county. Um, yeah. cause it's just an epidemic and there's so many people that, you know, were just facing troubles back then. Yeah. Right. And still today, but that really hit that peak back then. Okay. So you went from there and, and did you then partner and build your business? We did. So we started growing it and, uh, there was a point at which he wanted to do something different than I had an opportunity to take all of my skills and go work for a startup that was doing what we were doing and helping people in foreclosure, but on a bigger scale than just a one-off, you know, somebody got a letter in the mail and called me or I, I knocked on their door and we had a conversation, but more of a scaled business growth, nationwide goals and, you know, just playing a completely different game. And it was also a completely different shift in my head because I had always done face-to-face -face sales and they were doing it 100% over the phone. Wow. And was that fun for you? Did you enjoy it? Uh, I did. So I started out with them on the operation side because they had someone kind of running sales and then that person wasn't a good fit. And then like many times at organizations that I've been at, I start in one and then shortly end up uh, running something else or running most of it. And uh, so then I you know, kind of got... Uh, led into the sales side and the marketing side. Uh, and I really enjoyed it. I found that it was a, a very good fit for trying to persuade people to make the right decisions and really help themselves out and using that power for good, which is, you know, this person has trouble financial. They don't want to make decisions. They just want to put their head in the sand. And how do you get them to move forward right. uh, and all over the phone, not being able to read body language, not being able to see them, not right. them not being able to see you and trust you. How do you do all of that over the phone? Well, let me go back. I want to hear more about that, but let me go back to what you said about you're the guy in that business that starts in one thing and you end up in this and end up in this, which I think is, I think that is the currency of today's business is that good companies can keep people mm -hmm. if they let them flow and learn and do new things and challenge them because that's what people want. They want to master new things. What was it about you that made you the guy that could move around like that? Um, so there's two things and, and these are kind of tenements that I take through everything that I do. One is that, I view the customer journey, you know, customer experience, and there's all these fancy terms. Yeah. I view that as one person going through a company's process that starts with marketing, stops in sales, and then ends with customer service, fulfillment, processing, you know, whatever that final stage is. Mm -hmm. And it's, but it's one person. Most organizations, they have marketing, which, right. and then they have sales, and then they have operations, and they have customer service or success. And they view all of those in these little silos, and all of those silos don't like the other silos because they're not doing it right. Um, and I view it as one customer. That customer does not care that your marketing person is mad because your salespeople aren't converting enough leads. I view it as one person and the company should because that's how they make their money. Yeah. And so I, because of that, I have many, many times ended up being the VP of sales, marketing and operations all at once wow. because I'll tie all of it together because it's one customer going through in my opinion. Right. So it's, yeah, it's one chain, one smooth, yep. seamless yep. flow. You're so right though. As a coach, I work with companies all the time. I mean, they, it, it's shocking. I had a, a 911 dispatcher say, well, we don't really talk to each other. I thought, really? No, no, we're just in our cubicles. We, if we need something, we'll send an email. It's like to the person next to you, aren't you people connected to our lifelines? I mean, it happens in every kind of business yeah. where people just dig into their little area and do their thing. But you're right. The customer could care less. They don't know yeah. who's Jason and who's, you know, Jim and who's Joan. It makes no difference. They just want it done right for them. So 
I, I'm going to bet, I'm going to just go out on a limb here and bet, and tell me if I'm right, I think likability may have something to do with it. Because when I first talked to you, I thought you were a hoot and smart <laughs> and funny and creative guy with this wacky, fun background. But you can't make those kinds of segues and you can't pull those kinds of teams together if there's not a real sense of collaboration and, and approachability. Do you agree with that? Yes. And, and I think one of my keys is I, I, I feel like I'm pretty approachable, but not maybe the charismatic, like life of the party, you know, person that's a part of a group. However, my heart is always focused on two things. One is how do we get the customers, the right customers to enroll and then get them in a better place? doesn't matter what you're selling. You could be selling them software. It's still going to get them in a better place or help them with their goals. And so, and I'll go to the ends of the earth to help those customers and build a system. Uh, and then for the sales reps, I want everyone to be successful, even if that means identifying maybe it's not a good fit. Like you were talking about people that move around, like Jim Collins says in Good to Great, first figure out the, you know, the, get the right people on the bus. And there's many times where I figure the wrong person is on the bus and they need to leave, but from the right place inside that I want them to go out and be happy in life. And uh, I think a lot of teams and a lot of owners you know, appreciate that about me because I always bring the data and the statistics and the numbers to back up whatever crazy claims I've got. Yeah, I, I always cite, when I speak, I often will cite the, um, the, nobody knows quite who said it. I always look at quote tracker to see if anybody <laughs> really knows, and no one ever does. Culture eats strategy for, for breakfast, which people yep. thought Peter Drucker said. And, and I think, yeah, you've got to have a strategy, obviously, but it's just like the bus analogy. If you've got the right people and the wrong strategy, they will eventually figure it out. Yeah. But if you have the killer, perfect, right strategy and the wrong people, it's not going to happen. So it really is about that, that person that can connect those dots and connect the people on a kind of a gut and emotional level. And when other people feel like, oh, yeah, it's really not about us. It's about the customer. It's always about the customer. Is, is this one little action customer focused or not? Then it's a little easier to judge. Yeah, and I have had the pleasure in organizations I've been a part of and then now in my consulting is that pretty much my one mandate that I've had as the overarching kind of command from above for me is help the sales team be successful and make money. And if they're making money, it means they're hitting their goals. If they're hitting their goals, it means they're making sales. And if they're doing all of that, the company is winning. So how do you get that to happen within the culture of it? And so, you know, sales teams... They might, they might be worried about me sometimes when I first come in, but then they understand, like, I'm there as a good coach to help them win. And, uh, you know, how do we win together? And no one is more metrics focused than salespeople. I, I've had clients that, you know, they health medical technology sales, and they've got those 46 page contracts and documents, and they're doing the math in their head before they leave the meeting of like, this is going to work this way, and we're going to do this. And then, it's amazing to me. So I have to ask you. I have often said, you know, there are people that have a sales gene and people that don't. What do you think about that? Am I wrong? So, no, you're not wrong. And I have this debate constantly. And yeah. in the stuff that I publish and then on my podcast, I mean, I'm constantly talking about this. I think, I think at a different level, I think there's people who have the charismatic storytelling over the top persuading gene and okay. that's their personality it is the life of the party they're gonna talk they can they have a story for everything maybe they have a joke for everything they just have this rolodex in their mind of stories and they can entertain and they can move you like you get done talking to them you have no idea literally what happened uh but here but you it was are, fun right? but yeah. it was fun it was great maybe you bought something maybe you regret it later but you bought it it was a great experience and there's the people who have that personality type and some of those traits. And then there's other people who don't. And I think those are two different things from people who have the natural sales gene and don't. So for example, for myself, my mom, before my parents retired, my mom was a banker and in finance. And my dad was a engineer, like a research engineer and a project manager that moved his way up in his organization uh, in an engineering firm. And so, so does that I make have, you a double nerd right off the bat? I, 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 I theoretically should have no sales ability. Uh, I have no sales DNA. It didn't even skip a generation because it's not like my grandparents were salespeople. Nobody was a salesperson ah. in my family tree. And so, but here I am. And one of the things that I embraced years ago, I fought it for a long time, but I finally embraced it, which is, not having the charismatic, over-the-top, 
kind of salesy, like you said in the intro, the salesy part. Yeah. Um, if you don't have that, but you know how to sell and persuade and ask questions and you're curious and you're empathetic, you can actually do way better long-term than those people who are kind of surfacy and fluff. Um, and so I really encourage people and work a lot with salespeople who they don't think they're a salesperson, but they have the qualities that the prospects actually want to interact with and buy from. Okay. So I, I, it's funny, I, I do a lot of corporate speaking and people just assume I'm an extrovert. I'm one of those people, it's like, I'll get up there and talk to a thousand people and that's really comfortable. But once I have to go into the VIP thing, especially if it comes before I've talked and nobody knows me, that's really hard. Huh. So, but I've learned to draw on it. You know, I'm a situational yeah. extrovert. I say, I've taught myself how to do it and it's fun when I've got a purpose and I know my material. Mm -hmm. So it feels like that's the part I have to draw on. But then sometimes that part of you just clicks off where you think, oh, now I'm selling. Oh, now I went into that other place. Yeah. So how do you help people that aren't salespeople make that switch and be better at what they do? Well, I think it's really about embracing their strengths and what they have, right? So are they naturally curious? Are they empathetic? Do they, do they understand and are they excited about what they're selling, right? At some level, do they understand that that's going to help the other person? Do they want to make that their goal? And if they have those things, they don't have to be that salesperson that everyone thinks about, right? The used car salesperson yeah. in the shiny suit right. that, you know, super excited when you pull onto the lot. So you don't have to do that to be effective. What you have to do, and this is what I teach a lot of people, is think of yourself as a salesperson, but more like a doctor and how they operate. If, and I tell people all the time, if you had a 15-minute you know, doctor's appointment, for the first 14 minutes, it's them asking you questions, poking, prodding, you know, measuring things, checking you out, and then the last minute is, here's the diagnosis, here's the prescription, any questions, now take this form and go get this done and book your next appointment. And so when salespeople do that, consultative, if not transactional salespeople. Yeah. When they do that, then they shift from this order taker salesperson to a sales professional that's now providing solutions. And then it's just easy from there. It's really, it really is in the questions, right? We've really got to remind mm -hmm. ourselves, we've got to dig in deep and ask all those, ask the right questions so people know what we've got, what we bring to the table, but also how much we care about their results. And, and the, what I noticed, and I'm glad you brought it up, is that you got to know what questions to ask, but you really have to know why you're asking them and then what you're going to do with that info. I see a lot of salespeople who are taught to ask questions. It's all about discovery questions. That's the big buzzword now for the last couple of years, like on yeah. LinkedIn, discovery, discovery, discovery. And then uh, they ask these questions just because it's on their checklist and then they don't do anything with the info because they're not actually listening. They're just following a process and it's, it's, it's pointless. So the next step would be you're asking so that we yes. can get to this next place. How do you think mm -hmm. of that transition then? Uh, then it's just switching into a solution, you know, providing a solution, right? It's the diagnosis and then it's the prescription. So based on what you're telling me, I can see how this is going to be a good fit because I'm going to help you with this or a company will help you get from here to here or I'll, you know, you'll get out of this situation, whatever it might be. So based on what you've told me, here's how we can help. And based on that, here's what we should do next. And then, like a doctor, I am a firm believer in the assumptive close. Like, I'm all about assuming. The doctor doesn't say, well, based on what I can see here, your leg is broken. What would you like to do? <laughs> Let me know what you want to do next, and I'll be here for you and help you. No, the doctor's saying, your leg is broken. You're already here, which means you gave me permission to check you out. Now I'm going to assume you want it fixed. Now I'm fixing it. Or, I, you know, based on what you're telling me, I need to give you this prescription. Now go fill it. Not would you like a prescription and would you like to get yeah. better? No. Because we want it, that person to be the expert, right? We want to be the expert. And that's where shifting salespeople, like I said, from that order taker, which is what I see a lot of is yeah. salespeople who are more order takers and they're afraid of pushing. But if you push and assume in the right way, from the right place in your heart, with the right solution for the right people, then that absolutely nothing wrong with that. And that's what you should do. Oh, that's interesting. I think sometimes when I'm when I'm doing it right, which mostly means just following my instincts and not mm -hmm. trying to do anything, yep. 
um, people will call a discovery call, just like you said, <laughs> to ask about a speaking engagement or coaching. And, and it's, you go into all of that when you have a really honest conversation and get excited about what you do because you love it. And it happens to be the right fit. And you could point out, oh, here's how that might solve that problem. Or here's how we could fix that. Or here's how we should address it. Then it's, it becomes a little bit more fluid and, and organic. And the person on the other end of that is happy and feels good about what you're selling them or moving them forward at because they know it's going to help them and it's about their solution. It's not about yours. It's not about just booking the, the whatever it is. Does this yeah. work the same way with products as it does with services? Because those are I mean, of... I I think it works for anybody. I mean, I, it's funny because I've only sold services and I've only helped, well, mostly helped as a consultant companies with services, but I fantasize at times about selling cars and, and uh, because I, I like cars and cars are such a physical thing that people want emotionally and then want somebody to talk them into intellectually so it makes sense. Now, I don't really believe in most people should be buying new cars and it's probably not financially smart for most people. So I wouldn't do it for very long and I wouldn't want to be a hypocrite. But I, I, I know that if somebody were to walk on a lot and I were selling cars and everything I know about that is like I would do the same thing where I would ask them a load of questions, find out what they want, and then basically give them one Permission. option or two options. Ah. Well, but, and one or two options. Like, okay, so based on what you told me, you need a minivan because you have four kids. And so would you like that in red or blue? Here's the two colors. Now let's go for a test drive and we're done. Instead of, I'm just going to walk you on the lot or show you a car that makes me more money. Like it, I, I think it applies. And of course it, it depends on the price point and the sales cycle, but I think all of that holds true for all sales processes that involve some con kind of consultation. So you've done the, the shark tagging. You might as well get out on a car lot and try, as well. try and sell some Ferraris or something. You sure, know, that'd be yeah. fun. Uh, so what's your dream car? You know what? I don't really have any. I'm not very good at that game. I don't really have any like tops, like top favorite movie, top oh, yeah, this. That's a hard uh, one, yeah. Uh, you know, favorite cars. I, I don't think I would be upset at any of those, uh, you know, really fast, luxurious High -end, cars. High-end, fast, yeah. sexy cars. Yeah. Okay, no, that's good. Yeah. Okay, so tell me about the business now and how you form this business where it's, it's more than just just training one person, you've got a whole automated kind of process flow, right? Yeah. Your IT came, I knew that was going to come in somewhere, <laughs> that IT background. Well, and I'll tell you, like my time that I spent at Microsoft and doing some IT and the tech support, what I really learned was a lot of systems and processes. And then what changed for me and I got exposed to early on, which was great in my sales career, was Michael Gerber's book, um, uh, E-Myth Revisited. And with that, it's all about systems and processes. And so one of the things that I've taken with me in managing companies, as well as what I do now and helping companies, is I look at everything kind of McDonaldized. Like, how do you McDonaldize your business? Because again, and I joke about this, but it's true, McDonald's uses teenage Sometimes I'm going to say idiots, but they're just new to the workforce. They don't know what they're doing. Babies. It's their first job, babies, right? Yeah. So teenage, not, and not everyone, there's, there's people who yeah. are returning Older to the people. workforce, all kinds of things. But right. globally, but and I've been to enough McDonald's all over uh, in various countries and in various states to know that they're selling billions of hamburgers a year on the backs of a very low experience workforce yeah. mm -hmm. and um, they do it very well and you know exactly what you're going to get no matter which McDonald's you go to uh, in the country and other places and so how do you do that with a sales team and so that's really what I try to focus on is the systems and processes not just how do we get superstars and hope that they do a good job how mm -hmm. can we hire average you know, salespeople and then make them great with sales systems and processes and scripts and accountability and turn them into superstars that are spitting out a good product without them needing to be superstars. Oh, that's really interesting because you're right that it, not to malign McDonald's, but yeah, it's usually young and inexperienced yep. people and they're the ones who are charged with selling all those billions of hamburgers, mm -hmm. not to mention the real estate that McDonald's owns, of which course. is another key to success. So is it different with every sales team that you go into? Is there a, or, or do you do have a similar process? 
No, it, it's interesting because during my consulting time, many times I, I've looked at, especially other consultants, or I've talked to other people and kind of network and brainstorm. And some people have this system, like here's the system I use every time. And here's my formula and here's my, my process. Uh, and from my experience of what I've seen, every sales team is different. Every culture is different. Every process is different. What they're selling, the product or service is different. Now there's some fundamentals, right? Like building rapport and creating trust and asking questions and active listening. So there's some fundamentals that are always there. And then there's just the customization of all of that in the framework of that company. Because do they have five reps? Do they have 50 reps? Do they have one person? Are they in the US? Are they overseas selling to the US? So they've got to know how to deal with Americans that they're selling to over the phone. Um, and so it's, it's really custom. And then also where are they at? They have a team that's doing well and they need to get to the next level. The team is not doing well and they need to get rid of everyone and start over or they're oh. starting from scratch. And you've, de you've dealt with all those scenarios. Yes, I have unfortunately dealt with the, you know, everyone needs to go. Let's, let's uh, start over from scratch uh, in the past. Yeah. Wow. That's really fascinating. Um, so what has been the biggest challenge of building your business? You know, the, the biggest challenge is on the marketing side in finding owners who admit that they need some help and want some help and they, they want to bring somebody in. Because a lot of times in the beginning, I thought, okay, well, I'll deal with sales managers and reach out. But sales managers always think they know it, and that's their job to know it. Yeah. And they're not going to say, hey, I need help, right? Most people don't want to say I need help. So really, it's about finding owners, other CEOs and founders who are like, I have a team, it's not working, or I want to get to the next level. Because there's two be parts, right? Yeah. There's, we're losing. And then there's, kind of like Tiger Woods at his peak, still had seven coaches because he wanted to get better in every single way. So there's also owners I deal with, which are like, we're doing well, how do we do better? better. That's so much like coaching. And I, yeah. you know, we're both consultants that work with other companies that it is occasionally the person who raises their hand and wants to be, wants a coach to help them. More often it's someone within that team, their supervisor who says, wow, this person, Either they, they need a boost because they're brand new at this or they've taken on this extra responsibility or they're, they've derailed or they need some, you know, they need to know what's going on or they've got those blind spots. Um, but it is, it, it's fun taking people who are doing a great job to an, a higher level. That's always a lot of fun yeah. seeing that growth potential. So I see when I, I talk to a lot of salespeople, especially because uh, they're well organized, there are lots of conferences and they're the most fun. I, I can tell when I'm at a sales conference and I, I walk into the hotel, you know, you roll in with your roller bag and it's usually their cocktail hour because I'm going to speak the next morning and the decibel level is through the roof. Yeah. Whoa, speaking oh, of. Sorry. <laughs> did you, or did you knock your drum set over there for a minute? Nah, the, uh, the, the microphone. We're good. Oh, they'll take, they'll cut this out by the oh, way. Okay. So I walk into a, a hotel and then when the sales me meeting is, is letting out or they're in the cocktail lounge or something that the, the volume is through the roof because they are, a lot of them are very extroverted, not all, I'm yeah. sure. Um, but there's, there's this thing with salespeople and tell me if you've experienced this, there's the tactics, but they are so much driven by mindset because they are the people that I find most in tune to sort of self-help and personal growth because they're always up in their own game. They're always trying to figure out how do they, they sort of switch their mind to that higher level. And it's fascinating to me that I find them far more open to, well, let me try this or let me experience that or let me think about this or let me read that because they're li really looking at where am I holding myself back and where can I flourish? Do you see that? I do, but only in a sub-segment of the sales population as a whole, of the people who are at the top or striving to be at the top and are working that way. And similar to, you know, and this is unfortunate, but I see a lot of people, if we're talking about sports, let's say basketball, is there's those people you're describing, which are the professionals or striving to be a professional. They wanna play in the NBA or they're in the NBA and they wanna keep getting better and better. And then there's the people who like playing basketball, let's say like myself, and I will play some pickup games, but I'm not going to spend five hours a day practicing my shots because I literally don't care and it's not my passion and I don't think it would help a lot. But and maybe you're not going to NBA. And so I'm not going matter. to NBA and I wasn't going to go to the NBA even when I was younger, so it doesn't matter. And right. so, but I think unfortunately there's a lot of people and you might not see them because they're not in the bar having fun or going to the conferences 
trying to absorb, but there's a lot of people out there in sales who are actually playing rec pickup sales down at the court at, in their neighborhood, um, but you know, they're, they're struggling and they're not effective, but that's who the consumers are dealing with and companies are hiring versus the sales superstars, which are the ones like what you're talking about where they're hungry and they're striving. And I've gone into enough organizations and enough sales teams in enough countries to know that there is a population kind of 80, 20, you're going to have the ones who want it and want to spend time. We're not going to organization, the ones who are asking to spend time with me. And then the ones who are hiding from me because they don't want the accountability and they don't want me to talk to them because they're afraid of what's I'm going to tell them, which is what they already know. And so do you find a lot of the, the theories that, you know, build on their strengths and all that is that mm -hmm. you need to take that top 20% and take them even further and don't worry so much about the middle or the bottom. What, what do you think? Can you take that middle and bottom up higher? I think you got to break it up into three segments. So there's the top and then those mostly, depending on how they're doing within your organization, you just let them you let them do what they do and you don't try to put much on them, but you should really spend a lot of time and effort with them coaching them. Um, and then there's the middle section. You want to give them some time and the systems and the framework and, and provide a space for them to raise up. And then there's the bottom, which you need to just take an assessment, figure out if they're a good fit or not. If they're not, you need to cut them if they're not going to move forward. And so the numbers I show and, and I talk to people about all the time, because usually what happens is sales managers, will deal with the lowest people and try to raise them up and ignore right. the top people. Yeah. But if you I can, can take that. a top, but if you can take a top producer who's doing 10, right, they're selling 10 widgets, uh, let's say 10 widgets a week, whatever the number is, and I can get them to do 50% better, which yeah. it might seem like a lot, but if somebody is doing well in their, what you're describing as somebody who wants to absorb, you can get them to do better. So mm -hmm. I can get that 10 widget a, a week person to do 15, or I can get the bottom widget seller who's doing two a week to do 15, they're doing, or 50% better, they're doing three now. And so the company could make five more or one more sale a week. And so where is your resources best spent? Okay, so uh, who's going to be the easier one to coach? Yeah, uh, that's, that is kind of the conventional wisdom. And it makes sense that you focus on those top performers. If you can get the middle and maybe the bottom up, it, it really goes right in line with the Gallup studies on engagement that there are these people at the top level who are actively engaged, passionate, learning, growing. There's this middle chunk that are just kind of checking the boxes, doing their thing and not much more. And then there's the bottom who are actively disengaged yeah. and can actually harm the organization they do. by mistakes or safety or whatever issues that, that they are not doing right. So yeah. it's those top performers and then try and boost the middle sum. Okay, so what is your best advice for us non-sales people just to remember? If I, if I can take a word of wisdom or an idea from you, from you home with me or into my practice. Um, I would say that the number one thing would be to be curious and then to be empathetic. Like those two, th I know you wanted one thing, but I'm gonna, no, I'm gonna say two. No, that's good. But, but you know, if you're curious, and this is what's interesting, and again, my, my life path and my journey and everything that you mentioned early on, it's interesting because I was like, how does this relate to sales? Like, am I just a hot mess? Or is this all like, where am I at? Because I've done many other things we haven't even talked about. I know. Uh, I... But uh, what, I, what I realized is that, you know, in marine biology with science, it's about curiosity. It's about problem solving. It's about seeing an issue and then how do you fix it or just wanting to learn more. Um, and when you're in sales and you're doing it right, like it's all about curiosity for that other person, everything you can find out and know. Uh, you know, it's funny because I remember seeing this when I was a kid and my mom still does this. And now it's funny because I do this. But literally, if we went out to eat at a restaurant, by the end of the meal, she would know so much about our server yeah. because she would ask questions and be curious. And she's not a salesperson. She's a banker. But she was always curious about people. And so she, she will know somebody's life story by the time we get done. Oh, that's great. Um, I love those people. Yeah. So that's my mom and I will do that too. And I don't try it with the people who force it. You can feel it and it's terrible. Um, but if it happens natural, it's great. And so, but then also empathy. So yeah. whenever you're selling and I'm selling and, and you're selling your services, uh, it's about empathy. It's like, how do I help you get to a better place with or without me? I might refer you to somebody because they're a better fit. Yeah. Um, knowing there's enough in the world for everybody. I always think curiosity and kindness. Mm -hmm. if, if we all just had some of that or a lot of that, Mm -hmm. that those are the two most important traits that Perfect. exist as far as i'm concerned yeah, yeah. and you, yeah. you empathy kindness okay so one final question to sum up here jason 
if you could make your radical change in the world, little change, big change, global change, what, what would be, what's your pet fantasy about how to make things better? A, just some sort of radical shift you could make. Well, I, in thinking about what that might be, but in terms of what my current focus is at this point in my life, obviously it's going to change uh, at some point, but my, my magic wand, if I could make it happen right now, would be for all of the salespeople in the world to be using those things we talked about and selling to people what could actually help them and benefit them and helping their prospects get to a better place. Again, it could be a, a purse, but how do you how does that person help them feel better? And it's what they want, not what I want to sell to them, but literally helping salespeople shift and focus on doing it the right way for the right reasons to help people and for their reasons and not for their uh, salesperson's own financial gain. Um, because that's really the mission I'm on right now is to shift how the world sees salespeople and shift it from this dirty word to a profession that people appreciate and respect. Oh, for putting the right things in the right people's hands at the right yeah. moment. That is beautiful. Thank you very much. Jason Cutter, uh, where can we find more about you? Uh, best place to go would be cutterconsultinggroup.com. So there's a lot of content on there. You can find my podcast, blog articles, con connect with me on there. And then the other place is LinkedIn. So search Jason Cutter on there and you can follow me. There's a lot of content on there as well. Awesome. Thank you for being a guest here today. Talk to thanks you for, soon. Thanks for having me, Libby. You bet. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Radical CEO. We invite you to view the episode blog post at our website, libbygill.com forward slash podcast to get links and access additional resources. Join us again next time for another episode of The Radical CEO. Radical CEO.